Excellent. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, you can all hear me loud and clear. Um, we will get things kicked off. I wanted to give uh, a couple of minutes for everyone to log in. I see a lot of people still joining, but we'll, we'll start. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining today's call. Um, I wanted to quickly uh, introduce myself. I'm the president of the Oxford University Society in Sri Lanka, uh, Hiran Imboldenia. Uh, the Oxford University Society is uh, the collection of alumni in Sri Lanka that are represented from the university. And you know, for a long time, we've been focused a lot on developing that alumni community uh, and not enough on developing the students uh, that are aspiring to apply to the university and helping them make successful applications. And um, this was something that we wanted to focus on a lot more this year. Uh, and I think the advent of Zoom and doing virtual conferences has helped us move uh, at a rapid pace into this. Um, you know, we're really excited. We've got a huge response, overwhelming response for today's uh, session with over 300 people kind of registering for the event. Uh, we've also got an excellent lineup, which we'll introduce in a minute. Uh, but, uh, you know, just to say very quickly that I hope uh, that coming out of today's session, um, everyone's able to get at least three things out of this. Uh, number one, how to make a successful application uh, to the university. Uh, number two, uh, potential sources of funding you may have um, potential sources of funding potential sources of funding that you may be able to access um, and then finally uh, a little bit about life at Oxford and how to make the most of your time uh, at the university um, just before I hand over to Nelika, I think we've already had uh, you know, one uh, incident just now. I would request everyone to please keep your microphones on mute. We do have a lot of participants on uh, the call today. Um, so I think just in terms of the proceedings, if you can always ensure that your microphones are on mute um, so that the speakers can be heard clearly. Um, with that, I'd like to hand over to Nelika. Nelika is the uh, immediate past president of the Oxford Society. Uh, and she will lead us through the agenda and the speakers uh, for today. Over to you, Nalka. Thank you, um, Hiran. It's really a pleasure to be here and um, welcome to everyone. Thank you to all of those who are participating in this event, in particular to all our great speakers for agreeing so promptly when we reached out to you. Uh, it's been many years since I was a student at Oxford, but it was one of the most fulfilling experiences of my life and I really hope many of you will get a chance to have a similar experience. Um, I will start by outlining the structure of today's um, event. It will be followed by some guidelines to be followed please um, while you are participating. Um, sorry let me just So um, the outline as it is, is that we will start off with an introduction uh, by the British High Commission to the Chiefening Scholarship. Then there will be a segment on funding and scholarships by the British Council. I will then speak about getting effective references because I think that's very important. Um, then Kate Davey from the Graduate Admissions Office at Oxford will be talking about applying to Oxford and uh, there will be a moderated Q&A session followed by a Q&A session in breakout rooms. Um, a brief introduction to the speakers today. Um, Ayuni Munasinghe from the um, British High Commission Sri Lanka is the Communications Manager and Chevening Scholarships Officer. Nishika Hassim is the Manager Higher Education and International Services at the British Council, Sri Lanka. Uh, I am Neluka Silva, um, Senior Professor in English at the University of Colombo, and as Hiran said, the immediate past president of the Oxford Society in Sri Lanka. Kate Davis is the Senior Graduate Student Recruitment Manager at the University of Oxford. Rishan De Silva, 
is the Vice President, University of Oxford Alumni Network. He will moderate a session with uh, former and uh, current students, Vihanga Munasingha, Minoli Vijayatunga, um, Sarani Jaiwardhana, and uh, Shamara Vettamuni. Just to give you some general rules, uh, please mute your microphones during the event because there are so many people and it's going to be very distracting. Um, if you have any questions, please write down your questions in the chat box while the panelists are speaking. Cameras are allowed and encouraged uh, when asking a question. Please use the raise your hand um, emoji, I think, during the Q&A and the Chatham House rules will be followed. Um, right, I would like to now invite um, Ayuni Munasingha from the British High, Commis High Commission to speak about the Chevening Scholarship. To introduce you to Ayuni, um, Ayuni has worked in the communications field for over five years. This is her third year at the British High Commission. Ayuni will talk about the Chevening Scholarship. Ayuni plays tennis in her free time and enjoys traveling anywhere with a beach. Thank you very much, Ayuni, and over to you. Thanks, Nilka. Um, let me just share my screen very right quickly. I hope everyone can see. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Nilka. Um, and thank you to uh, the Alumni Network of Oxford for inviting me. Um, I, as I said, I am from the British High Commission, and I'm actually here to talk to you about one specific uh, scholarship program. Um, my, my colleague from British Council, Nishika, following me, will speak about a range of other scholarship programs available to you as well. Um, I'm really happy to see such a huge turnout, um, and I'm hoping to see some of these names and faces in the applicant list, hopefully this year or next year as well. Uh, so Chevening Scholarships, um, they are the UK government's global scholarship program, and it's funded by the Foreign Office. Um, it is purely for a one-year master's degree in the UK um, for any subject. Um, so in a little while, I'll tell you how, how, what are the subject areas that you can study. Um, so the scholarship is available in over 160 countries and territories. Um, so there is an alumni network that spans over 50,000 globally as well. Chevening scholars um, are very passionate about creating positive change in their home country. They are very good at building relationships. They're resilient, uh, determined, and they have uh, short and long-term career goals as well. And these are things that they outline and they show us what they have done and what they plan to do in, in their applications. Um, Chevening scholars tend to rise to prominent positions in their countries and in their chosen fields. Uh, so the eligibility criteria is actually very simple. Um, you have to be a citizen of a Chevening eligible country and you have to have already had an uh, uh, have an undergraduate degree and you have to have at least two years of work experience. Um, so Sri Lanka is and has been on the Chevening eligible list for the past 30 years. So we have a very uh, diverse uh, alumni association um, now. Uh, and we have had a lot of questions as to why, um, as to whether you need an undergraduate, like you have to have completed your undergraduate degree, whether you can apply while you're still doing your degree. Um, unfortunately not. Um, one of the primary reasons for Chevening is that it's to support your master's education, it's to support your career development, your networking and your relationship building into your career as well. Uh, so we encourage everyone to complete the undergraduate degree. Um, do take some time to work and experience because sometimes what you study in your undergraduate degree might not be what you want to pursue as a career and do your master's as well. So Chevening provides you an opportunity to um, further your uh, academia and your professional networks uh, with the scholarship. As a scholar, um, you, your tuition fees are fully covered. Um, you get a living allowance uh, every month. You get a stipend that covers your accommodation and your food and other expenses. You get a uh, you get a return flight ticket to and from the UK. We make sure you come back home um, and uh, any additional grants required to cover essential expenditure. 
So the benefits of being an achieving scholar um, is that um, in addition to being an international student in a university, uh, you also get invited to exclusive achieving scholarship events. Um, so these could be um, anything from networking opportunities to talks to trips across the UK to volunteering opportunities. Um, so you not only get to be a part of your university, your UK university that you get to apply to, you also get to be a part of this other dynamic network while you're still on the scholarship and once you come back um, to help you in your field of study, in, in your career path as well. Uh, so over the years, um, Chivney Scholars have had exclusive opportunities um, offered to them. These include internships at the BBC World Service, uh, volunteering opportunities, uh, relay competitions. Um, there have been roundtable discussions with the Foreign Office diplomats. Um, these are uh, opportunities as a Chivney Scholar that you will receive based on the field of uh, study that you have, but they are usually open to everybody. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, physical events are restricted, but that hasn't stopped some of the scholars from being a part of virtual events um, and uh, networking online as well. So the Chivning alumni community, um, one of my favorite areas about this job uh, is working with them actually. They are quite diverse, they're very dependable, but more importantly, they're very fun and um, extremely passionate about their respective fields. Um, the, the program has been running since 1983 um, and we have about a two, 300 alumni network here. Um, you get to be a part of this, this local and this global community. Um, which actually comprise a very highly regarded global network of skilled professionals in a variety of fields. Um, there have been presidents from other countries um, that have gone on uh, the scholarship um, uh, while they were studying for their masters as well. Uh, so I know uh, this uh, might seem, you know, far reaching sometimes, you know, how do we get this scholarship? Um, but these are some of the individuals over the past 30 years that have received the scholarship. I'm hoping most of you have heard these names. Um, you know, Vinyari Ratna, Shirani Bandar Naika, Ambika Satkunanathan, Jeevan Kasena Naika. These are all names uh, people uh, are associated with. And at some point um, in their career, they also were achieving scholars. Um, so my first thought when I saw these names was, my God, so far reaching. How can we ever do what Vinyari Ratna, Shirani Bandar Naika has done? But I want to tell you, they all started off someplace as well. So these are some of the most recent um, achieving scholars and alumni. So right at the top, you have Umesh Mormudali. He's currently a lecturer at the University of Colombo and the president of the Achieving Asso Alumni Association. Senel Vanyarachi, who is a co-founder of Hashtag Generation. Uh, Chiranti Tarindu Sachin and Aisha are all scholars currently on the program uh, pursuing dynamic careers in their respective parts as well. So. In 20 years time, we're going to look at them and see, my God, look at how much they have accomplished. But today, you know, they're part, they're part of this new network um, as well. So uh, don't think that you can't apply um, while it is a very competitive process. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very tough application process, if I'm being honest. Um, it's also completely open to everybody. Uh, so digging through our database, these are some of our University of Oxford alumni, um, hopefully uh, that you will recognize. So Nishan Dimel, the executive director of Verite, Minoli, who is on call right now um, as well. She will guide you through um, your, her Oxford experience. And Nalanga, um, she is currently on the scholarship. She actually just finished her quarantine. Um, so these are some of the Oxford and Chevening alumni as well. Applications open every year from third of uh, from the first week of August to the first week of November. Um, that's usually set. You have three months to sort of um, apply uh, and pr prep your application. Um, there are four questions. So there's a little bit of quick insight into the application. Um, there are four main questions. The first one is on leadership and influencing. The second one is on networking. The third one is, is studying the UK, and the fourth one is on career plan. So if you think of it like a story you're writing. So we want to know about what you have been doing, what you are doing and what you intend to do and how you are going to leverage your academic networks, your um, professional networks, your voluntary experience, etc. And what you have um, planned for the future as well. Uh, so this is actually um, just a few of the subjects that our scholars are studying over the past uh, three years, I think, not even three years, over the past um, two years, maybe. 
Uh, so this year we have 13 scholars going and they're studying 13 different subjects. Uh, one of the most frequent questions that we get, um, myself and the alumni, is what is the area that Chivning uh, funds, like what is the main area? And I'm very happy to say that uh, it's open to everybody. Um, you can study anything. So this year we have artificial intelligence, sports medicine, international relations, poverty, educational research, um, subjects I've never heard of, like architectural conservation. So uh, be creative. Don't, don't think that this is, you know, just for lawyers or just for international development. This is open to anybody. Chimney is on social media. Um, I have not put this here because I want to give them more likes um, or more followers, uh, but they do give some awesome tips um, on what constitutes a great application, um, what are the things that you can do to um, strengthen your application. There are anecdotes from global scholars. Um, so if you are interested in the scholarship, I would say do give them a follow. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite pictures. This is just there to show everyone, you know, this is, yes, this is a very serious scholarship and we, you know, your, your application is supposed to be tough, but there is a fantastic cohort that you get to go with every year. There is a fun aspect to the scholarship. Um, you know, you might go as strangers, but you come back as family and you get to be a part of a bigger family. So um, if you are passionate about creating a difference in your field, um, this is a scholarship for you. Um, you know, if you're passionate about, you know, making this country a better place, as we all are, um, this scholarship is definitely for you. Um, again, not to give you Kinchi Lanka more likes, but um, we do also post a lot of anecdotes um, and videos from our scholars locally. Um, so Minoli herself has just given us um, a quote that you can find on our Instagram and our Twitter and our Facebook pages. Um, but we do have a lot of videos and um, anecdotes from our scholars um, who speak about their achieving experience and um, sort of talk you through your achieving journey as well, or their achieving journey to support your achieving journey. Um, so if anybody is interested, do visit the website, um, www.achieving.org. And um, yes, that brings me to the end. I'll take questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Ayuni, um, for that presentation. And now um, let's move on to funding and scholarships, um, which um, Nishika Hasim will speak on. To introduce you to Nishika, Nishika Hasim is the manager of higher education and international education services at the British Council in Sri Lanka. Nishika joined the British Council over 10 years ago and has worked extensively in collaboration with both the Sri Lankan and UK higher education sectors for the past seven plus years. Nishika supports UK universities in their marketing and recruitment activities delivered in Sri Lanka and also manages various scholarship programs on offer. Today, Nishika will be presenting scholarships available to Sri Lankan students and resources available to those interested in studying in the UK. Thank you and welcome, Nishika. Thanks, Neluka. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Just making sure everyone can see that. Uh, good evening, as Neluka mentioned, uh, my name is Nishika and I'm the manager of higher education and international education services at the British Council. Um, so this evening, um, I'll focus specifically on scholarships, uh, funding and resources available for anyone who's interested in studying in the UK. I'm going to skip this slide because uh, I don't think uh, you need any more convincing you're here today because you've already decided you want to study uh, in the UK. Um, the Study UK portal, which is managed by British Council and is a global portal, um, will have lots of important and vital information for you, um, right from, you know, why you should study in the UK up to, you know, how to find university or specific program. To scholarships uh, and then even information about 
once you do move to uh, the UK, uh, support that you can get uh, also things like accommodation, food, travel, all the things of interest. So uh, if you need any information, uh, this is uh, quite important uh, for you. So uh, I've given the link down below. Um, if there's anyone interested, you can have a look. Uh, moving on to scholarships. So uh, I'll be talking about three uh, scholarships that are available. Uh, the great scholarships, uh, the Commonwealth scholarships and the women in STEM uh, scholarships. So the first one, the great scholarships is a jointly uh, funded campaign run by uh, the UK government's Great Britain campaign, British Council and uh, UK higher education institutions. Uh, so each scholarship is uh, worth a minimum of £10,000, which covers your tuition fees uh, and is for a one-year uh, postgraduate course. The great scholarships are offered across a variety of subject areas. And in fact, uh, the last cycle, there were eight um, scholarships on offer for Sri Lanka from um, subjects ranging from architecture to agriculture, business, and uh, psychology as well. Uh, some of the other uh, areas of interest was uh, climate change, climate action, uh, psychology, uh, law, business. So uh, you name the subject, I mean, it's available under the great scholarships uh, if you're interested. Uh, the new application cycle for 2022-2023 academic year is set to open in October uh, and the information will be available either on the Study UK portal or the British Council website. So you can have a look there on uh, details for the application deadlines and information on um, the universities as well as the programs on offer. The second one is the uh, Commonwealth Scholarships. The Commonwealth Scholarships has actually been uh, in place for quite some time. There's a, a very wide network of alumni in Sri Lanka who've received both Commonwealth Scholarships as well as fellowships. And uh, it's basically aimed at students from the Commonwealth who can demonstrate that uh, without this scholarship, they are unable to pursue their studies in the UK. Um, the eligibility criteria is quite straightforward. You need to be a citizen or a permanent resident of a Commonwealth country. Uh, and if you are applying for a master's, then you need to have an undergraduate honors degree. And if it's a PhD level, then it's a, a, a master's degree. Uh, the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission has what they call six development themes. So that's science and technology for development, strengthening health systems and capacity, promoting global prosperity, strengthening global peace, security and governance, strengthening resilience and response to crisis, access inclusion and opportunity. So uh, all of the subject areas or the programs that they offer uh, cover these development themes. And although there are only six development themes, here you can see that if you look at it in terms of subject wise, it does cover uh, a wide aspect of subjects. So it's not just limited to a, a niche area. Uh, so Sri Lankan students are eligible to apply for certain scholarships and fellowships. The uh, CSE does uh, offer um, more options as well, uh, but Sri Lankan students are eligible to apply for a shared scholarship, uh, a professional fellowship. So that's uh, starting at one month to three months to six months, uh, or even you know, a, a one year fellowship a distance learning scholarship, which has uh, become quite popular uh, given the current uh, circumstances as well. The master's scholarships and the split side scholarships where you can do part of the program in Sri Lanka and then part in the UK as well. Uh, the application process, uh, the applications are usually forwarded through the National Nominating Agency in Sri Lanka. It's the uh, Ministry of Education and the University Grants Commission or through a university or a non-governmental organization. Uh, the application uh, deadlines for the new cycle 2022-2023 are awaited. Um, and there's uh, uh, heaps of information on the British Council website as well. Uh, just to add a little point here, um, because the bulk of the applications are handled by the Ministry and the University Grants Commission, uh, if there's anyone uh, on the call here that is looking at applying through that 
uh, process, then the um, UOGC does have additional criteria, uh, application criteria as well. So it will be worthwhile just asking you know, colleagues who have applied before um, and uh, who uh, anyone from your university, if you are part of a, a state university who have applied as well uh, for any additional um, application criteria as well. Uh, but if you look on the uh, Commonwealth Scholarship Commission website, that gives you what the commission is looking for. Uh, the final one is the Women in STEM scholarships. This is a new scholarship scheme that has been introduced uh, just last year, and it aims uh, to increase opportunities in STEM for girls and women, just as the name suggests. Uh, and it targets women with a background in STEM who can demonstrate a need for financial support uh, and are looking to inspire future generations of women to pursue careers in STEM. Uh, the main uh, benefits, of course, it's the economic support the, that they uh, cover the tuition fees, uh, English language support and academic prestige because it's a, um, it's a very focused um, scholarship scheme uh, given to only uh, a, a small number. Uh, so it's very competitive, but uh, we were lucky that Sri Lanka had uh, uh, a few scholarships offered in the first cycle itself. The applications have closed for 2021. The new cycle will be available in the coming months. Once again, there's plenty of information on the British Council website as well. Uh, so those are the main scholarship schemes that are available, uh, but there are uh, plenty of other information also available on the Study UK portal as well. Uh, I'll take questions at the end of uh, this session uh, on scholarships or any other information on applying um, to study in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nishika. Um, and now I'd like to move on to a section which is very close to my heart and um, uh, involves me a lot, um, which is, um, about referees and references. Um, when we were discussing this event, we thought it would be useful to do a, a session on this because um, there are, I think references are a very uh, important part of the application process. And um, as an academic who's been teaching for over 26 uh, years, I find that um, many times students are not really aware of how crucial this aspect of the application is. And, um, and over the years, I've acquired a few do do's and don'ts, which I'd like to share um, with you from my perspective, but primarily for students. So I'd like to um, share the screen. And So um, references, while they are, um, Oxford has a particular uh, process for referees, um, much of what I'm going to say will also be um, important for any university that you apply to for graduate studies. So um, this is what um, Oxford says about the, guide, um, the guidelines that they give their referees. So it's, um, it says your reference letter should comment on the applicant's academic achievements or relevant professional achievements, if professional, your assessment of their work under your supervision, their suitability for the course that they are applying to, and any other information you consider relevant. So while they do ask some specific questions, uh, from a referee's point of view, looking at this, particularly during the early stages of my career when I had to uh, um, write references, it was a very daunting task. And, um, and I think I found it extremely challenging and invested a huge amount of time agonizing over the kind of references that I should give students. So, um, as I said before, it is a part of the application that needs to be taken seriously because if you look at it from a university's point of view while you the applicant obviously is going to be um, 
showcasing um, all your achievements. This is the uh, part of the application where the university gets an outsider's perspective, which they take seriously. So um, a few do's to start with. Think about your referees carefully. Now, this is something that it seems very kind of commonsensical, but honestly, I'm not sure if some students actually think of who they are going to ask a reference from. And um, I also um, think that it is important to try and approach your referee personally. Um, sending an email may look, may seem uh, suitable to you, but from a referee's point of view, um, who may have to deal with quite a large number of students every year, especially if someone has left uh, two or three years ago, they may be kind of trying to figure out who it is. And if that is the case, that's not the referee you should approach. Um, when I say personally, a telephone call or a face to face meeting would be ideal because um, one thing that I think you need to know is that you also, as a student, you also need to be able to read between the lines when you approach um, a referee. You might find that actually your referent, your ref the person that you thought really loved you is actually um, not so enthusiastic about giving you a reference. And if that is the case, the chances are you're going to get a fairly bland or lukewarm reference, which is not going to really get you into any university. So it's good to feel the pulse of your referee. Um, it's great if you know your, um, your referee really well and you trust them, but if it is somebody that you have done a few courses with and you've got really good grades, amazing grades even, you still might want to actually approach them personally. The other one which follows from this is to choose someone who knows your academic work well. And that's, and particularly uh, able to comment on areas such as your ability to participate um, in class, your um, ability to conduct independent research, original thinking. Those are all key areas that universities um, would like to focus on and are interested in. The other one which really irks me and I've had to deal with often is please give your referee enough time, not the day before it's due. Um, and when I say enough time, I would advise you to give the person at least three weeks. Uh, because remember, they're not just sitting there waiting to write references, although some students may think so. Um, they're very busy people and they've got a ton of stuff um, in addition to teaching, admin, personal commitments, etc. cetera. Um, it's also important to, to give your referee a sense of the overall academic performance, of your overall academic performance. You may find that your referee knows very well about, um, knows your work very well from about three or four courses, but it's always good for them to have a greater understanding of how you've performed in, um, in all the courses you've taken over the years so that you can see whether there is consistency and they can comment on that, which is important. Provide a CV. Now that I've said significant achievements, research experience, related work experience. Your referee doesn't want to know how many years you spent at McDonald's um, or uh, what um, prizes you, uh, you got in grade five. And believe me, this may sound really crazy, but there have been times when we have got 20 page CVs with pretty much 90% irrelevant information. So, and, there's nothing, and you can be, 
really sure that if you give a, a referee such a long CV, by the end of the experience of reading it, even if she started out thinking of giving you an exceptional, extraordinary reference, just the, just the uh, task of sifting through all the information will definitely put them off and you're not going to get the reference that you wanted. So these are just a few do's um, and I hope you will kind of keep them in mind especially because you want to have your referee in a really good mood when he or she writes your reference. Um, then a few don'ts. So don't inundate your referees with irrelevant information. Make sure that it's useful, not just for your, for your application, but also the course that you intend to apply for, because at graduate level, they are looking at specific subjects and areas and knowledge about that. Don't be hierarchical. I say this because sometimes you think, oh, I'm just going to ask the top guns in, the, in my department, the professors or the chair or whoever who, has, who seems to have the most amount of clout. The problem is if they don't know you well enough and they can't comment on your academic performance, even if they have uh, 30 years of experience and they've been to the most amazing universities in the world, it's not going to help. You need to be very judicious in your selection of who. Hierarchy um, alone is not going to be impressive. Don't be dishonest. This also sounds a bit crazy, but honestly, sometimes we are so keen on impressing people that we tend to kind of doctor the truth a little bit. The problem is if your referee isn't um, aware that you are not being 100% honest, it could really um, be a disadvantage to you. Because um, firstly, if your referee finds out that you're not, you haven't been honest, that's going to be a huge disadvantage and he or she is going to be really annoyed. Um, and then, of course, the institution you're applying to would also, um, if they find out, and I, I live by the motto that the truth will come out. So um, that in itself is going to be a disadvantage. Um, don't forget to be polite. Now, I have students who write begging letters and calls asking me for references and then I don't hear back from them at all once I've given them references and they've forgotten about me. They've forgotten to even tell me whether they got in or even whether they didn't or where they're going and then two years down the line they're back asking for another reference. What do you think people are going to feel? Not so accommodating. So um, Politeness really matters when you're dealing with referees. And if you, even if you didn't get in, do send them a little email or invest a few minutes in a call and explain what happened. So that then if you have to ask them again, they'll be very willing to do so. So finally, just to, to conclude, excellent references with appropriate information are crucial to any good application to Oxford and other universities. Take it seriously. Thank you very much. Okay, so now I would like to um, invite Kate Davy, who's with us from the UK the Senior Graduate Student Recruitment Manager. Um, we're really privileged, Kate, and thank you so much for coming from another meeting straight on to this one. Really appreciate you being here. Um, Kate has worked for the University of Oxford for over 10 years, initially working in alumni relations and events, then marketing and communications for St. Anne's College before moving to graduate admissions and recruitment in 2019. 
She manages the postgraduate recruitment team and oversees recruitment activities for potential postgraduate students. Kate is a keen baker and with other members of the team created a cake version of the Radcliffe camera, one of the most famous buildings in Oxford. Thank you and welcome Kate. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to start sharing my screen. So hopefully uh, you can all see my presentation okay and someone will shout if they can't. Um, and that is the Radcliffe camera, so that is what was created in cake form a few years back now. Um, but um, that is uh, yeah, certainly one of the most famous buildings in Oxford. So what I'm going to cover today is a general introduction to our graduate course offering. Um, how to research and make your application and I'll also give you a little bit of information about colleges and a few top tips about fees and funding, though of course some of that has already been covered um, earlier. So just really quickly, um, why might you consider applying to Oxford? So um, teaching has taken place here for over 900 years. Um, the university has been rated number one worldwide by the Times Higher Education, um, six years running. And we also come out first for research quality in the last uh, UK wide research assessment exercise. Um, all of this is supported by world leading facilities for research and study. So, for example, the Bodleian Library, um, museums in Oxford as well, um, and also global links and collaborations with institutions and research centres around the world. So, our graduate community, we have a really um, large and diverse graduate community. There's over 13,000 graduate students from um, over 150 different countries, and that's around half taught courses and half research. Around 60% um, around of our graduate students come from outside of the UK. Um, we actually offer more than 350 um, graduate courses um, across the different disciplines. Um, and really what we're looking at, what we're enhancing is um, we're emphasising your ability to work independently, um, but you'd be very much supported at Oxford by a world class academic community. So where do you start? So you'll have two main sources of information to consult if you're applying for graduate study at the University of Oxford. The first of those is an academic departments website that will give you more information about courses, staff and student profiles. Then um, what you can see in the background on this slide is the graduate admissions website um, that gives an overview of all of our courses um, and detailed information of requirements, information about fees and funding, information about colleges. It also um, has a link through to our graduate application form. So where, where to start with looking for courses? So, our A to Z is a really good um, place to have a look. That has a full list of all 350 graduate courses, and there's lots of different ways that you can filter and search that. Um, it could be that you're looking for taught courses or research-based. Also, you can look at um, an academic department. Um, and as I say, we do have a course list that is organized by academic department if you have more of an idea of what you're looking at already. Then what you'll be looking at is you'll click through to one of our course pages. So you find a course that you're interested in, click through. This one is for the DPhil in biochemistry. Um, so the page itself is tabbed. So you can see that across um, the top. Um, the first section that you'll come to is about. When that contains a description of the course content and also the structure of that course, then what's really useful is at the bottom of that particular page, um, you can find links through to any other courses that might be related. So we'd recommend having a look at those in case you're kind of thinking what is related to this course, what other potential options in this area might there be. On the right hand side of this page, you then find the um, deadline for the course and also the current admission status. So if the course in status indicator is green, the course is open. It turns to yellow around a week before the course closes and then red once the course is closed. Um, you can also find information like expected course length, um, statistics around how many places we might be offering, and also um, the, the number of applications across a three-year average. So you can see how many applications per place we receive for that course. So 
where to where where to next really so we'd really encourage you to look at those course pages um look at the academic department's web website and really research your options look at department's websites to identify any groups look at research and staff um, that you might be interested in um working with um the other thing we would say is if you're applying for a PhD, so um, we call it a DPhil at Oxford, but um, it is um, the same as a PhD, um, it may tell you that you need to contact a supervisor, so check. And if you do, then get in contact with them as early as possible. Email those um, supervisors to check, um, sort of ask for more information, check if they're taking on students, those kinds of questions. Even if it's a course that um, you don't need to contact a supervisor, really good piece of advice is that you should have a look at though staff and their research areas, because you need to have in mind that there'd be appropriate supervision available for you at Oxford. So that's a really important part of making a competitive application because you do need to be applying for a course that matches your interests and also where there would be that appropriate supervision. The whole application form process is fully online. Um, the main piece of advice we would give, and this kind of comes through on lots of points in the presentation, is just don't leave it till the last minute to submit. It's amazing if you're trying to submit on deadline day, the Wi-Fi cuts out at, the, at that point in time. So we really do recommend that you try to submit your application two weeks before your chosen deadline if you can. Um, it's really a lot easier for us to help you solve any issues a few weeks in advance than if it's on the actual deadline day. Um, you, as I say, it's all online and most deadlines will be 12 midday UK time on the deadline date. And as I say, do try to submit two weeks beforehand if you can. So check the deadline for your course as soon as possible. Um, make sure you know. So as I say, we do have set deadlines for our courses. Almost all courses will have a a December or a January deadline um, and you need to apply by the earliest deadline for your course if you want to be considered for Oxford scholarships or any scholarship that uses a December or January deadline. Um, there may be other departmental studentships there or other funding sources that do have different deadlines as well. Um, in addition to the deadlines on this slide we do um, have courses with deadlines in November in Mar and March um, if you're ready for, to apply by the November deadline, then um, we'd encourage you to use that deadline and you would be likely to receive an earlier decision. Um, if you decide to apply by a March deadline for the course, the main thing to be aware of is that you wouldn't usually be considered for Oxford scholarships if you do choose to apply for that deadline. But as I say, there may be other scholarship schemes with different deadlines. So you can find out more about our entry requirements um, on the um, tab that is on the course page. Um, our courses will usually be asking for a strong upper second class or a first class undergraduate degree. There is information on our website about international qualifications as well. Um, you also need proof of English language proficiency. However, you don't need that when you actually apply. Um, if you were to receive an offer, it would then be um, potentially be a condition of that offer. And there are English language waivers available in certain circumstances. Um, so, for example, a degree level taught course in English that's lasted longer than nine months. So we do recommend checking that. Just really quickly, this is information that is all on our website about English language proficiency. So a course will either ask for standard or higher, and then those are the requirements that you need to meet. As I say, um, there's a web link there at the bottom. So you can go and have a look and um, read the information. But as I say, you just don't need to worry about that at the point of actually applying. So once you've chosen a course, you need to then go to the how to apply tab to look at the checklist of documents that you will actually need to submit with your application. And the department, they are the ones who decide what goes into those section, sections. Um, make sure your documents are the right length. If I'm going to give one tip, it is really to have a look at what it is they're asking for. You know, if they're asking for an essay of a thousand words, that's what they want. They don't want an essay of 10,000 words. So it's just really worth having that in mind and make sure you do check that. Then at the bottom of the how to apply tab on the course page is that link through to the application form. So these are some of the um, supporting documents that you might need. So a personal statement and or a research proposal, that depends on the course. 
Um, all courses, though, will need an official transcript. Um, they can take a little while to come through. So we do recommend looking into that at an early stage to make sure that you can um, get that and um, get it into your application. We do accept um, screenshots or self of your self-service grades. Um, so you can submit that as part of your application, but it does need to have um, the grade information, your name and your institution's name really clearly indicated. So if you're going to do that, do make sure that you've used a screenshot that does have all of that included. Um, we'll also be looking for a CV. Um, I think Naluka covered that really well. Um, a few pages, one to two pages, um, you know, not 20 pages. Um, make sure it covers your kind of key academic achievements. Um, and you'll also be um, asked um, for references. Again, that has been covered, but I will add a few more tips, I think, to uh, the ones that have already been added. As I say, there may also be requirements for written work and things like that. So if you do need, um, you could need one of these things, a list of projects or supervisors you want to work with, that's um, particularly in sciences, a detailed research proposal, um, you tend to see that more in social sciences and humanities courses, or kind of a statement about your interest in and why you want to apply for that course. What they're looking for in those things are kind of evidence that you have relevant experience, but also really your interest in pursuing that research. Um, and that you've kind of thought through the research question, what it is that um, you want to cover. Um, and it's just, you know, worth thinking about all of these things well in advance. It may be worth talking to someone um, you're currently working with about them as well. So I think most of this has already been covered, but think early about who your references will be and absolutely do try and get your requests to your referees as soon as you possibly can. So what happens um, with the University of Oxford application is as soon as you start your application, you should ask your referees then and you've got an opportunity to add your referees to that application form. They then get an automated email request to submit a reference. But it's obviously really important you've added them to the application form after you've already approached them to ask them, otherwise they're not going to actually be expecting that email. So it is that personal approach before you add them is really important. Um, they'll get an email. Um, it's worth checking with your referee. Have they received the email? Has the request come through to them? Keeping in contact with them throughout the process, at all steps, again, um, that's been covered as well, kind of, you know, check that they've received the notification, check they've been able to submit. You get an email and also the referee gets an email now um, that will tell them their, their reference has been received. Um, so you will know that that is the case and um, try to give them a, a date that is kind of ahead of the deadline. Don't try and add a date after the deadline or, as I say, going through on the day um, and adding and sort of on deadline day and adding them. They're obviously going to really struggle to respond to that request. Um, so the, the key thing there is, is just being as early as possible on that. Um, and if your references are late, there is a chance that your application won't be assessed. So you should also have that in mind. So just a few more things that I wanted to cover, which is also a bit about our, about Oxford colleges. So if you apply for graduate study at Oxford, you are usually applying to a department. Um, so you, if you were successful, you would receive an offer from your department and then you would also receive um, a college offer. So um, you're, you'd been both a member of a department and one of our unique colleges. So colleges are multidisciplinary communities um, with students and staff from all different backgrounds and subjects. Some colleges, so most of our colleges are for undergraduates and graduate students. Some only accept um, graduate students. And really what a college is, is that home away from home. Um, it offers you pastoral support, support and also things like access to sports facilities, um, also catering. Um, some colleges will be able to offer accommodation as well. The main advice we say is you don't apply separately. So it's all part of our main application, um, that application for colleges. So if you're applying for a PhD or a master's, you would have a guaranteed college place. So it's up to you if you want to choose the college preference. You can put one in when you apply, or you can just say, actually, I don't have a preference. Um, I will also say that almost everyone ends up really happy at the college they end up in. So it's we do say it's not something you should worry about. Um, you, 
if you do choose a college, the one thing just to be aware of is that they, you might not receive an offer from that college, um, but you will be guaranteed a college place. So even if you kind of have selected one, um, as I say, it's not something you need to worry about. If they do um, do um, say that they are not able to offer you a place, someone else will. And also the other thing is that not all not all courses um, are accepted at all colleges. So you should just have a quick look at that if you are going to choose a college preference, just to make sure, you know, if you want to choose a specific college that that course does actually accept people on that course. Um, and you can see more about that on the college preferences tab. So I'm just gonna briefly cover funding because I think that there's been quite a lot on that already, but um, up to uh, 1000 scholarships expect to be available. So um, that's full scholarships um, from departments, colleges and others. These are Oxford specific scholarships. Um, a number of these do cover all fee statuses, nationalities and courses, for example, the Clarendon Fund. Um, for the majority of those Oxford specific scholarships, nothing more than a standard course option application is required for those. So if you meet the eligibility criteria and you apply by the deadline for your course, and as I say, if a course has a December or January deadline, that is also the funding deadline, um, you just be automatically considered. But we do recommend looking into the other options available, what other scholarships there are, whether there's also any that you do need to um, do any additional kind of paperwork that you submit as part of your application. And all of that is um, available on our website. So just some top tips, be practical about your funding, start looking as early as you can, consider what the options are, all the different scholarship schemes that are available. Make sure that you apply by the deadline for your course. So check those deadlines. Do you need to um, uh, include any supplementary materials? Um, start really as early as possible on your, on your research for that. Um, don't even wait until you have an offer or start your course um, to start out funding for future years. Um, as I say, work opportunities when you're here might well be limited and it's, it's also unlikely you'll have time to work enough to support full time study. So it's really important that you do have your um, funding in place and really try and then kind of think about college scholarships as well. Often, though, you don't need to. So, so you don't. Um, don't actually need to select the college as your preference to be considered for those so it's just worth being aware of that but as I say it's worth looking into those and there's lots of different kind of information about that on our website and finally um what is the decision timeline how does it work so you apply by, for the deadline by the deadline for your course applications are then checked and they're passed over to the department for review um, depending on your course, um, you might be interviewed, that could be via Skype, telephone or face to face. And then um, you usually find out by email whether your application is successful eight to ten weeks after the application deadline. Some funding offers are made at the same time as a course place, and some, um, but some scholarship decisions are made afterwards. So most commonly that would be April to June. Um, and you can find out more about our decision timeline on our website as well. Um, I've just, I'll briefly leave that slide up in case you want to know our contact details. Um, there's an email address if you do have further queries. I think if I'm just going to finish just quickly with a couple of pieces of advice, it's look at the courses as early as possible and really have a look at the document requirements. I will also say there's, a, there's some courses this year in um, some of our departments that um, need you to um, submit a um, CV by a reform. So you should double check if your course is one of those. If yes, make sure you follow the instructions really carefully. But actually for all of our processes, just make sure you read the instructions. We've got a really detailed application guide. A lot of people kind of don't necessarily look at that, but that will give you really detailed instructions about what you need to do. Um, and you know, if you've got any questions still, then you get, can get in contact with us, but there's absolutely loads of information on our website and lots of support there um, if you are, whilst you're making an application for graduate study. Um, thanks. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, that was really useful. Um, there's a question which I think many people want to know and I'd like to direct this to Nishika, Ayuni, and Kate. 
um, is that many students are concerned and want to know if scholarships are only available for DPhil students or DPhil studies and are, are there any scholarships available for one-year masters? Well, the evening, Ayuni, you already covered and it, it does cover one year, right? evening is for one year masters um, and it's unfortunately only for masters it doesn't cover a phd um, but i think nishiga ran through some other options that are available um evening does cover some mphil options as well for anyone that is interested so i would definitely encourage anyone to go on the website there is a list of course options and universities um uh, there's there's so much on there um so don't feel restricted and think that it, your area might not be there um architectural conservation is definitely one so anything is open um so yeah uh nishika yeah sorry nishika before you answer that one i actually i think Nelika, the because i think the one year programs were covered there was actually a question whether there was funding for how would a PhD student or a DPhil student go about securing funding if there was, in addition to the scholarships, where there are other options that people should be kind of exploring? Uh, do, do you want to go ahead or I can just add a quick line there? No, Nishika, please. Um, yeah, um, no, just to say, um, I think the Commonwealth Scholarship, uh, out of the three that I mentioned, the Commonwealth Scholarship is the only one uh, that's available. Um, but even with the Commonwealth, you get a different, uh, a variety of options available. So I would say have a look at the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission website, which gives you detailed information on all the scholarships on offer. But there's definitely options available there. Thank you, Nishika. Um, Kate, would you also like to say something, please? Yeah, so um, there, there is some funding available for master's students. I think that's the simplest answer. Obviously, that you know, we there are, there are around a thousand scholarships and those kind of go to different things. It's worth having a look at our fees and funding pages, I would say. Have a look at the different scholarships, have a look at the different um, options, um, see what kind of things are being offered. There's also information on those pages about kind of other ways you could support yourself. I mean, I think some of the options is if you, if you, if you know, if you don't get an Oxford scholarship in particular, you might want to consider. Some people even have pulled together kind of different packages of funding, or and have been able to look at lots of different options there. Um, the main thing we say is just you you can't aren't going to be able to work a huge amount of hours when you're here. Um, sometimes there are ways you could kind of top up. So, for example, um, it may be that if you're doing a PhD, there's access to teaching opportunities, those kinds of things, um, so that you can kind of find some additional funding, but you couldn't fund your entire, um, your entire course of study in that way. Thank you so much. Um, Nelika, sorry, if I may, just one more quick one, uh, which may be a relevant one. There is, you know, applying for DPhils or PhDs uh, with local qualifications only prior to that, so local bachelor's or master's degrees from Sri Lanka, uh, any issues or barriers um, to applying uh, with students who have local qualifications prior? I, I can come on on that from Oxford. I mean, I think the main thing is have a look at the entry requirements, check if they meet them, have a look at our international qualifications pages, see if there's advice there. If you still have really kind of questions and it's it's not clear, I mean, obviously, I think the main thing I'll say is we are highly international. You know, we have people applying from all over the world with lots of different qualifications. So, you know, there's, there's so much information there, but also, you know, if you're really unsure, you really want to check, you can also contact the academic department just to kind of double check or to ask that question if it's something you feel isn't covered but as I say we're, we're really international and that goes for not just Oxford but every you know all over the UK you know other institutions as well you know we are kind of used to people applying for different qualifications. Well I applied with a local degree from the University of Colombo so um, I would say yes. <laughs> um, shall we move on Hiran? Yes, please. Okay, right. Uh, the next session, which is very interesting, is where we get to um, listen to the former and uh, present students who are um, following 
graduate study at the University of Oxford. Rishan De Silva will be moderating this session. Rishan is the current Vice President of the Oxford University Society in Sri Lanka. Rishan began reading for an MPhil, a two-year program in social anthropology at the University of Oxford. And upon deciding that he would not pursue the DPhil at the time, Rishan switched from the MPhil to the MSc one, one year program. Rishan is currently working as the executive director of a startup Indian Ocean think tank, the geopolitical cartographer. Rishan will introduce you to the student panelists, Vihanga Munasinghe, Sarani Jayawardena, Minoli Vijayatunga, and Shamara Vettamuni. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, uh, Nelika, for that introduction. Um, so yes, as Nelika mentioned, we thought it would be good to give you all a student perspective of life at Oxford and applying. Um, so today on our panel, we have Minoli Wijetunga, who read an MSc in education, Sarani Jayawardena, who read the MSc in evidence-based social intervention, Vihanga Munasinghe, who is reading for a DPhil in inorganic chemistry, and Shamara Wetimani, who is reading for a DPhil in the history faculty. Um, as uh, Kate mentioned, the DPhil is what Oxford calls a PhD, basically. Uh, Minoli Wijitunga was a Chevening scholar, as previously mentioned, at Lady Margaret Hall and read an MSc in comparative and international education. Before Oxford, Minoli was a consultant for IREX and Chemonix and a researcher. Minoli has a green thumb and can nurse plants back to life. Uh, Sarani Jawadhana studied the MSc in evidence-based social intervention and policy evaluation at Oxford's Department of Social Policy and Intervention from 2020 to 2021. She was a member of Mansfield College and was fun funded by the Widenfield Hoffman Trust. Before Oxford, she worked at MAS Holdings Strategy Team and in the Ministry of National Policies and Economic Affairs. She prefers to spend her weekends at waterfalls and jungles, but during lockdown is making due with her view of a Rajagiriya canal. Vihanga Munasinghe is at Lineker College, reading for the DPhil in inorganic chemistry. Before Oxford, Vihanga did a BSc in chemistry special at the University of Colombo. It was Vihanga's birthday yesterday, so on behalf of the OUS, we hope you had a happy birthday, Vihanga. And Shamara Wetimuni is a Bait scholar at the Faculty of History, where she is reading for a doctorate. Shamara is, a, is at Brazenose College, and before beginning her DPhil, she led the politics research team at Verite Research, a think tank in Colombo. She is currently trying her hand at writing an espionage novel about the Cold War in Sri Lanka. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. As Kate mentioned, choosing a course is important, and as a graduate level, there are a few different course options available within each discipline. Uh, as Nailika mentioned, I was admitted to an MPhil program where the first year is similar to an MSc, and the second year is supposed to be counted towards the second year of a four-year DPhil. Um, to start with, I'd like for each of the speakers to give us some insights into what their courses, the MSCs and the DPhils entailed based on duration and requirements. So if we can start with Minoli. Thanks, Rashan. So I did an MSc in education, comparative and international education. Um, so it was attached to the Department of Education, and that was a one-year MSc. In terms of requirements, um, of course, you'd have the undergraduate um, first, basically like a first class honors or a second upper. But apart from that, it basically invites people from any field whether you are a teacher, a researcher, coming directly after an undergrad, any of that works. And also in response to a previous question, uh, my undergrad was from the Open University, so that definitely counts. Uh, Sarani, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, so I did a one-year MSc in evidence-based social intervention policy evaluation. I think we already covered the kind of broad requirements for any program well, but in terms of what the program's requirements were kind of while you were doing it. Basically, I had um, two big exams at the end of the, so we had three terms, 
And in the first and second term, I had a few assignments that added up to 20% of my grade. I had two exams, each which contributed about the 25%, and then the remainder was made up of the thesis. So I think a lot of one-year MSCs will um, definitely have exams, and most of them will require some kind of dissertation as well. And some may have assignments. Thanks, Ishan. Yes, yeah. I um I'm uh currently a final year DFI student in inorganic chemistry. Um, so uh in the chemistry department there are, there are three main graduate programs. So uh what I'm doing right now is the DFI, which is equivalent to a PhD, as uh, it was said before. Um, there's also another program called CDT program, which is uh which represents Centre of Doctor Training. So, um, so when it comes to a DPhil program, uh, it takes about three to four years to generally finish the uh, program. Um, when it comes to a CDT program, in the first year, um, uh, you uh, it, first year comprises of like uh, taught pro uh, taught um, lessons, uh, uh, and also at the end of the first year, you get the opportunity to work in different uh, labs before you select which lab you want to actually do the PhD on. So it's basically takes about four to five years, unlike the DPhil. Um, and also we have a master's by research in the chemistry department. So, uh, so you, that's, that takes about like two years. And if you want to uh, continue it, extend it to a DPhil, you also have that opportunity at the end of your second year. So you won't have to uh, spend more time again to do a DPhil. Uh, uh, so you can just uh, do extend it do uh, one more years of work and get a DPhil. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you, and Shamara, do you want to talk okay, to Thanks, well? thanks, Rishan. Um, so the DPhil in history is a three to four year degree. Um, and unlike the master's programs, it's, it's purely research. There are no exams. You, the final output is a thesis of between 75,000 to 100,000 words. And typically in, in these uh, research DPhils, you have two vivas um, before your final viva. And that just means it's a sort of oral examination where you submit written work uh, and internal and, or, um, and then finally external examiners read it and, and have an interview with you. Um, so there's an oral exam. Um, and these vivas take place, for instance, the transfer of status viva takes place in your first year. Uh, and, and then a confirmation of status viva takes place in your third year where you submit one or two chapters. And, and, you, and, and basically these examiners give you feedback on it. And it's generally meant to be a supportive, constructive examination where they also then say, give you the green light and say, okay, go ahead and write up your thesis. You're ready to, to submit. Um, I, I, I will try and give some specific advice for applying to a history DPhil, but I'll also, I, I hope that some of it's transferable because I realize not everyone is applying for a history DPhil. So when applying, you're trying to make a case for why your project is unique or if it's contributing to an area um, in, or, or, or where it's, if you're trying to contribute to thinking on a well-researched area already, you're trying to show how you're bringing something different to the table. And so in your application, it's important to discuss things like your methodology, the various sources or archives you're going to uh, use, the, the skills you have or the skills you're going to work on developing in order to pursue this particular degree. And this can be something like learning a new language. For instance, if one set of your sources are in Portuguese or something like that. Um, and when I was applying, I wrote about 16 drafts of my personal statement before I submitted it. And I must have got at least six people to read it and give me feedback. Um, I would say reach out to specialists in the field, obviously keeping in mind what Neluka referred to about etiquette. But I found that senior scholars were actually really generous with their time and they gave me immensely constructive comments. Um, obviously, it's easier if you're working on a Sri Lanka project to then reach out to people in Sri Lanka. If you're working on something internationally, it may not be as straightforward. But people are usually willing to help. Um, and finally, just pick a topic that you really like, because if you're going to work on it for four years, you need to be really passionate about it. So yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, I think as Shamara mentioned, the, the DPhil courses, people pretty much know that they want to go into a DPhil. Um, Minoli and Saran, if you don't mind me asking, uh, what made you choose the MSCs and not an MST or 
and MPhil if there were in your programs? Um, for me, it was, I was changing fields essentially. My undergrad was in a different field. And I, so it was in English and language teaching, but I wanted to study education broadly. So I wanted something that was a bit more theoretical to lay the foundation before I decided whether this is where I want to go for a DPhil, do research in. And I've decided now that it is, but it was good to have that theoretical foundation. Yeah, I was also, um, so I was pretty sure that I didn't want to go into academia. Uh, I can't really see myself doing a doctorate right now unless, you know, I really find something that I, as Shramana says, want to study for four years or more. And so I wanted to um, kind of upskill myself. I wanted to learn a new set of theory and skills and also potentially pivot slightly in my career. But I didn't want to take more than a year to do that. Um, and the MPhil programs at Oxford, basically, as you, as you guys have mentioned, the first year is very similar to the MSc, so it's a lot of being taught. And then the MSc, you kind of have like a really uh, kind of a hard knock to do your thesis in about three months. So you do a relatively short thesis. Your MPhil is largely self, you know, kind of self-driven self and, and, and research heavy. And I knew that as I wasn't going into a DPhil, I didn't want to spend a year doing just research. Yeah, that's great. Um, as Sarani mentioned, the MPhil, the second year of the MPhil is very much self-taught and very research inten intensive. So, it, and it's supposed to count towards the, the second year of your four year DPhil, I guess, or the first year of a three year DPhil. Um, there are also MST programs that are offered, which I think are nine months. Um, and I, I'm not sure if any of the people on our panel did those, um, but it's important that you all um, look at the courses that are being offered and make sure that the duration and the specific course is exactly what you want to do because there are so many different options. You can always switch out to something that is shorter and something that is longer also. Um, would you mind then also sharing a little bit about your faculties? Um, I know like for social anthropology, we got to go through the Natural History Museum <laughs> in order to go to class, which is pretty interesting walking past dinosaurs <laughs> on the way to class and all. Um, but yeah, if Shamara and then Bihanga, if you can talk about your faculties and um, Ganga, should I, can I dive in? Yeah. Yes, you can start, yes. Okay, so um, I'm really proud of my faculty because it's that beautiful, actually the library is that beautiful picture that Kate showed you, the Radcliffe camera is where the history library is. So it's just, it's such a pleasure to go in there and read. Um, and the history faculty itself is one of the oldest at Oxford. Um, and okay, as I mentioned, while doing a DPhil, you're, you spend a lot of time on your own, actually, but the history faculty does organize various events and seminars throughout the weeks and the years to try and create a space for like collegiality and, and, and intellectual exchange and discussion, but also support. So, um, uh, and, and I would also add that faculties as well as colleges do provide funding for things like language training and access to libraries and archives in the UK and abroad. Um, and also for things like attending conferences, which are obviously great opportunities to test out ideas, meet people from other universities who focus on similar topics, and obviously in the pre-COVID world for a bit of traveling. Um, and, and lastly, the, the Faculty of History does encourage their DPhil students to do some teaching. You very often are attached to a, um, a, like a, a college. And there you, you, know, you get to do the one-on-one -on -one tutorial system or, or, or lectures. Um, and you, you know, earn some additional money as well. So that's that's something I've really enjoyed. Yeah, to continue from there, uh, my experience as a, a DPhil in organic chemistry student is quite different from Shamara's because I work in the lab and I work as a group. So in our lab, we all have our individual projects, but uh, they all fall into a broad theme. So it's, it's really interesting. I really enjoy like talking about my project with other fellow teammates and uh, they're all like, it's, it's such a nice international community. They're best in their field. And uh, uh, just talk about it is like, you learn a lot and uh, it's, it's fun. We have, we have conversations from like politics to like food and about various things in the lab. Um, it's not just work. And for me, um, I think that's the 
that's the part that I love the most, the interaction that I have with the lab mates uh, throughout my DPhil. Um, apart from that, um, it's a lot of, um, you need to, you, uh, so as a synthetic chemist, uh, you need to spend a lot of time in the lab. Uh, it could be tedious. And um, I have to say sometimes, most of the time reactions don't work. <laughs> Um, but still, like, uh, that's the reason why they give three to four years to finish a DPhil. Um, so, but at the end of the day, like, when it works, I, and it will, um, it, feels, it feels really good, and uh, it's worth it, so, yeah. And Minoli and Farani as well? I can go. Um... My department is the Department of Social Policy and Intervention. It's very small, so it's one of the younger departments at Oxford, and it's like, therefore, and, and, and kind of it doesn't have a lot of, uh, it, has, it has basically two master's programs that I did and the comparative social policy one, and uh, a few kind of, a lot of students studying these years, but it doesn't have an undergraduate program. And therefore it's smaller, it's like not got as much money, it's not got the grandest of buildings, so it's much more niche. So if you are uh, kind of really looking to, so you, you should go into it if you know that that's kind of what you want to study in the kind of area that you want to go. Because in the field that they do, they are like the premier researchers in the UK and in like most of the world. But you know, if you were just kind of looking for a more general degree, for example, it wouldn't be something that you want to get into necessarily because it's quite a small uh, department with researchers who really care only about the thing that they are studying. And I think that's something you'll find in smaller departments. If you really want to look at the, the profiles of the people who are on the staff at the moment, because you have a limited kind of um, lecturing, lecturers and, and professors. And so if they don't have what you want to study, they don't have like miles and miles of, of resources to, to tap into. So I think that's something that you should consider. Um, so I think my department, the Department of Education, falls somewhere between Shamara's and Sarani's sort of because it is relatively new and there is no undergraduate program, but it has about, I think, either six, so there's another MSc being introduced um, this year for the coming academic year, and you've got also like the PGC, the teaching certificate and all that. So it's a very vibrant community, especially if you're someone who's keen in education, because you have everyone from a teacher to a policymaker to random people like lawyers turned to learning more about teaching to like a very interesting community. And of course we also have like this lovely little garden and a cafe, all that very secluded old building. So quite the Oxford vibe, I would say. Um, and yeah, so that was my department. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, as Kate mentioned, you apply to the faculty and not, not just the college that like you do at the undergraduate level. Um, so it's important that you choose um, your faculty closely. And as Sarani mentioned, like some, and Minoli as well, some um, faculties can be quite small and they quite can be quite related with another faculty. So um, like I when I initially thought uh, Sarani was doing social policy intervention, I thought she might be at the Blavatnik School of Government, um, but that's obviously a separate program. So it's important that you look closely at what faculties are offering what programs and then choose accordingly. Um, I also wanted to speak briefly with uh, Vihanga and uh, Shamara about the DPhil um, and how important was it to find a suit suitable supervisor uh, before you began your program? And if you can also speak about the importance of finding a suitable supervisor as a DPhil student. Yeah, it's, I feel it's it's very, very important and I cannot stress it enough. Um, so Shamar just gave a very brief introduction to uh, the, the exams that we have. So we, after the first year, we have transfer of status and after the second year, we have confirmation of status and um, towards the end, we have to defend our thesis. So at, at each and every level, at all these stages, you should get permission from your supervisor. So it's very important that you have a good relationship with your supervisor. Um, but also like uh, in my case, I was quite fortunate. I was able to find uh, a former student of my supervisor uh, who was from Sri Lanka. So I had a chat with her 
and uh, she gave me a lot of confidence before I apply because I applied directly for the DPhil and not the CDT training. So I directly applied for the group. Um, so that was very useful. So I would say just reach out to their students. So all supervisors have um, their students listed in their website and you can find the uh, email addresses in the website as well. So reach out to any of them or reach out to any of their past students. If, if you could find a Sri Lankan student, that would be great. I mean, if, even if not, like they're, they're very helpful. So just email them um, and they'll be really helpful. Yeah, I, I mean, again, just to stress what Vihanga said, I think at the first level, finding the right supervisor is probably the most important thing because they are your often single point of contact for those four years. Um, so you're not, you probably won't apply to just one university, it won't just be Oxford, you probably apply to a couple. So I applied to four universities uh, when I was applying for my, DF for my PhD. Um, and and what you uh, and what was really helpful was I emailed potential supervisors and I started chatting with them about my proposed topic. And it's a question of gauging their interest, whether they're interested in working with you for four years. Um, and just basically seeing, you know, see who you have a good rapport with who, who and who you see yourself working with for a while, because they are the ones who will constantly be checking on on your academic progress, but also, you know, they have to also care about your well-being in times of COVID and things like that. That stuff is important. So you want someone who's going to be fairly empathetic um, and understanding and approachable. So a really, really key point. But reach out to people, chat to them, and then make your decision. It's not, as Neluka said, it's not always about applying to stars as well. It's, um, you know, you, you want to work with someone nice. Yeah, I guess also at the MPhil level, um, it's important that you look at who the potential supervisors could be. I remember I was I was keen to get one professor who happened to be on sabbatical while I was there, which was a big drawback for me to continue in the MPhil. Uh, so it's important that you reach out to the professors and as Shamara and Nilika said, not just the star professors, uh, people who are relevant to you specifically. Um, now, I guess we'll move on to a more, I guess, fun segment. <laughs> it's about life at Oxford. Um, so we'll start with Minoli. What do you wish you had known uh, when first applying to Oxford from, from Sri Lanka? Um, there are two things I would say. The first one is more about, so when you apply to Oxford, like Kate said as well, you apply to a department or a faculty, but you're also assigned to a college. And I guess in a way, the division of labor, like whom to go to what, was something that I wish I knew because for the longest time, your point of contact is your department because they are the ones offering you the position. But then your welfare and pastoral care gets taken over by the college. And let's say if you want an extension on an assignment, you can't go to your department, you have to go to your college as academic advisor. So I wish that was something that I wish I had a better grasp on, especially considering here we have like one university that essentially takes care of things, sort of, you know, trying to figure out where to go to do what. Um, the second one, though, is I wish I knew how to ride a bicycle before I went to Oxford, because it is a cycling city and I had no idea how to ride a cycle. So I basically spent the first term with a couple of friends, them helping me to learn how to cycle. So I walked for the most of the time, but yeah, I learned it gradually. So I would say those are the two things that I wish I had known. Very true. Um, Sarini, what was one thing you found challenging in applying and how did you handle it? Sure. Um, so I think my advice on applying um, is that information is really important. And one of one piece of that puzzle is what's available and officials so I can't talk about you know, really trawling through the website. One of it's what's official but not available. And that's about having confidence to if something's not clear, emailing um, you know, the department, the faculty, the college, whatever, and asking for information and having, you know, not being afraid like or oh, I'm emailing someone from Oxford and that's a scary thing, it's something that you may have, have in your mind, but everyone's there to help and keep it very nice. And connected to that is the information that's not official and not available and that you have to take a little effort to find. And that's about the feel of your course, right? So every course, every department feels differently and you know, listening to us is going to give you that idea because we have had four completely different experiences at Oxford. And it's really important to be brave enough to reach out to people who don't know 
like friends of friends of friends, or even sometimes strangers, and just ask for a chat, a WhatsApp voice note, you know, some kind of inside information, um, because that helps you know what programs to apply to and not to apply to, because you will not apply, enjoy every program at Oxford or any other university. It tells you what to talk about in your interviews and your applications, and it's really important. Um, and I think that can be a stumbling block, block for me and for many other students in Sri Lanka. They're kind of told sometimes not to tell people what you're trying to do until you get it and you can kind of safely and securely talk about it. And it's, a, it's kind of seen as a scary networking thing and it's really important to get past that. I have asked people I don't know for input and I have also been asked for the last eight years by people I have no idea, I've never met advice from applying to university and scholarships. And I've never like resented giving some time, especially now when you can literally just send a voice note to someone. Uh, so just be confident that everybody, 95% of the people won't probably want to help you. And they might take a week to get back to you, but they will help you. Um, I think that's really important and it's something that is a challenge. Uh, and the other thing is uh, making time, especially if you're working a full-time job, to take the time to have your application ready, both in terms of writing your references, but getting all that additional docs, uh, documents ready. So for a personal example, I I took like a week to get my undergrad thesis and my writing samples and things which I needed for some application ready because it was in a file, in a hard drive that was only compatible with a laptop that I didn't have. So if I had left that to the last minute, I would have not been able to you know, get those documents ready. Um, and I think there's a kind of two things. So if you're, especially if you're working, give yourself time to get all the antiquities and just have the faith of reaching out to people um, is a really useful thing to do. Yeah, those are great tips. Um, I remember, well, I think that everybody who has joined in on this call has made a great step in joining this because we didn't have, or I didn't have these kinds of resources available. And as Sarani mentions, it's important that you reach out to people and get that advice also. Um, and you can also reach out to the society and we can also look at ways that we can partner you with somebody um, who might be studying the same program. Yeah, and actually, oh, right. this year, uh, things that happened to me were like, people just reached out to me on email, uh, kind of blind, not just from Sri Lanka, but from all over the world, because my name and profile was now on the website of the department. And so they reached out to me saying, saying things like, I've got into the program and I want to know a little bit more about the kind of the track which to choose and you have the profile most similar to me. So people from Peru, from Colombia. So, you know, like feel free to reach out to a variety of people. Most people in the world are quite nice. So, um, there are other methods, even not just through like the networks of people you know. True. Um, moving on to Vihanga. Um, what do you wish you had known about Oxford in your first week, first month and first year? I am. Um, Minoli mentioned riding a bike. Were there other things that you need to know as you got there? Yeah, so uh, the first week, uh, we call it the freshest week and would be one of the best and also busiest weeks in your Oxford life. Uh, so you get, make sure that you check your email and uh, have all the events organized and sorted uh, because you'll be getting emails from the department, college and the university which could be quite confusing sometimes um so you get invited to like various events where you get opportunity to talk and meet people i would re highly recommend uh taking the best out of it uh, because for me personally like the best about thing about oxford is the people that i've met um there are some amazing people along the way and um yeah, and some amazing friends. And I think the college system helps us to uh, build up the bonds, build up on the bonds as well. So, and um, also at the first day that I came to Oxford was a Sunday. So, and uh, at around 5 p.m., um, I wanted to get a duet and a filler. And I realized that all shops on Sundays, like they close at 5 p.m. So, <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I would say if you want to get essentials, um, come on a weekday. Um, so you won't have, you will have a duet on the first night, unlike me. Um, and uh, yeah, so generally the term starts in October. So it's 
it's quite cold. So in October, it's uh, the temperature is around 10 to 15 degrees, and but it could go really down to like five to two and or even minus um, in December. So I would say like get some warm clothes and get yourself prepared for it. Um, and um, yeah, so by the end of the first month, um, I like I understood the importance of um, where I'm living. So uh, when it comes to accommodation, uh, you can either get university accommodation or you can get college accommodation or you can get accommodation through a private owner. So most of the time uh, you get uh, accommodation, like if you're an international student, uh, in your first year, you can get accommodation either through university or through college. Um, and as Kate said, like uh, for me, I'm from Linaka College and uh, for me, like uh, Linica College is home away from home. So I was really fortunate to get um, uh, accommodation at Linica College, um, where the dining hall, library, and the common room where we all socialize is in the same building that I live in. So it's been a really nice experience. And um, yes, and uh, finally, like, uh, I think Sarani and Minoli and even Rishan was telling the importance on um, reaching out. So um, we also have a, a Facebook group called uh, 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 Oxford University Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka Society. Um, so if you get admission, like please send a request and you can meet a lot of people who are currently studying there so who who are re, who are willing to help yes so reach out uh, we'll be really happy to help you thank you for that Vihanga, and for uh talking about the oxford university sri lanka society um shamara would you mind sharing about some other extracurricular activities that you have been involved in and uh, that are on offer sure um okay so oxford is a stressful place as an academic institution. It's an intimidating place to go to. And, and, and whether it's Oxford or some other university in the UK that you end up at, starting a master's or PhD is always going to be a fairly, you know, stressful uh, experience. So I think one way of making new friends, but also relaxing and giving yourself time to think of something else other than, you know, academia, it, it are the wonderful extracurricular activities that are usually offered by most universities in the UK. So this is really not specific to Oxford. Um, you can join things from like wine, wine tasting societies to squash and tennis or swimming or dancing or like philosophy. Basically, there is just a huge spectrum of uh, extracurricular activities. And very often you find that that's where you find your really good friends. I mean, there are wonderful people in your faculties, but say, for instance, if you work in a in a research um, detail where you aren't actually working with other people, then then you know it can be a quite a lonely experience. Um, so, I I play golf. Don't judge my choice of sport. But the point is, the the girls on the team, uh, and 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 just hanging out with them on and off, you know, the the course. Is, is wonderful and they are some of my closest friends and it's made a big difference to my university experience and for my undergrad and masters at a different university I, I always played sports it could be something else for you but it, it, it's where I found my community um, and I really recommend taking advantage of Freshers Week wherever you are as Vihanga mentioned and looking at all the different options available to students um, um, and, and you try something new, you, you never know what you end up uh, doing. Yeah. Great advice. Um, it is important to like get involved in extracurriculars as Shamara mentioned, because it can be your community outside of um, just the work that you're always doing. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. This has been very enlightening and for thank you for sharing your time with us. Um, for all the people who have questions, they, there will be breakout sessions where the panelists will be in uh, breakout rooms and you can ask them specific questions. I have so many more questions regarding like funding and colleges um, and you can ask them those yourself as well. Um, back to you, Hiran. 
Prashant also just while we're still on our segment, I just want to pitch my the scholarship that I was funded by because I don't think it's it's quite small and so it wasn't mentioned in the in the kind of overall one. It's called Weidenfeld Hoffman Trust. Um, and it's uh, it's about 30 years old, and I think I'm the first Sri Lankan that's been on it, so it makes sense that we aren't like super well of it in our circuit. But it um, it's for students from developing and emerging countries only, and it funds about 30 students every year, only doing one in master's programs. And it's a really amazing scholarship that provides full funding, um, a really thorough leadership development program that runs throughout the whole year, and is like really fabulous at creating a sense of community. The people on that scholarship are my best friends, um, you know, in this, in, from that whole time at Oxford. And so anyone who's interested in that, I think you can look for it. It's, it's listed in the Oxford funding uh, kind of pages, but it's also, it has its own website. So it's called the Widenfield Hoffman Trust. Just wanted to pitch that, they would want me to. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tharani. Um, Shamara, did you want to talk about your funding as well or? Uh, uh, yes, but mine is specific to the history faculty, and um, so so I, I'm funded by this thing called the Byte Scholarship in Imperial and Commonwealth History. So if you're interested in applying for a degree in history, I'd really, I, I mean, I don't know how many out here today are, but I would be very happy to talk to you about like that and look through your personal statements and give you any advice. Great, thank you. Um, over to you, Haran. Brilliant. Um, thanks, thanks, Rashan. Thanks, uh, thanks, everyone on the panel. Um, just a quick wrap before we go into the breakout rooms. Um, you know, I really appreciate the time and energy that all the panelists have taken and speakers have taken uh, to be with us today and prepare for today's conversation. As Rashan was saying, really, this was an opportunity that we were not given or we didn't have the benefit of. Uh, when we were applying, uh, you know, so really being able to hear from all these wonderful resources about their experiences, uh, as well as the advice uh, that they have to make a successful application uh, is really, really, uh, you know, helpful and insightful and hope you really found uh, what you were looking for today. Uh, I know there were a lot of questions around funding, which is why we tried to spend a little bit more time uh, focusing on that. Uh, we will now move into this breakout session uh, now where you will have the opportunity to move into uh, specific rooms where you can ask uh, more tailored questions to individuals. Um, but um, just to quickly uh, summarize today's conversation, I think really for me, the big takeaway was plan in advance. Um, there's a lot to be done in making a successful application. Uh, you know, Kate talked about the personal statement, the CV, the transcripts, and then Neluka really went into depth on their references. Give yourself enough time and plan it in advance to make uh, a successful application. Uh, and, you know, really, we would be happy to help you in the ways that we can. And I think, uh, you know, many of the panelists today have offered as well uh, to help. We will be sending out an email uh, after this event um, to give you, um, you know, some of the kind of resources that are available to you. Uh, uh, to make that application. So uh, look forward to that email. So if you registered for the event, uh, you will be receiving that, that email. Uh, and then finally, just a word of thanks to Daraz, uh, who has really supported us in this event and making things like this possible. You know, we really want to be able to give back. And this is a way of all of us paying it back for the experiences that we have had uh, in being able to attend uh, the University of Oxford and benefit from the education that we got. Uh, and we really hope that you will be able to uh, be successful in that journey as well. Uh, so with that, thank you very much again. And Neluka, if you could uh, take us into the breakouts. Thank you.